Greetings, Minecrafters, and welcome to another delightful Minecraft discussion on all things well-being. My name is Dr. Kimberly Quinn, and this gorgeous fall day in northern Vermont, wow, the leaves are just like a painting, better than a painting, because like they're real, right? They're 3D, wow. Anyway, and we are here to have a nice discussion on, um, well, of course, becoming the boss of your brain, because that is the main Minecraft theme. And with that, there are lots of little sub-themes. And so, um, you know, seeing our own value is definitely one of them. And today, it really relates to the value, inner value thing, as far as boundaries, because the topic today is beware of emotional vampires. And, you know, right out of the gate, I kind of want to start out with a disclaimer that in no way am I, you know, in this discussion saying not to go the extra mile for somebody you know, not to be a good person or anything like that. It's just, it comes back to our own value because sadly, sadly, and especially if you're an empath, okay, and empaths, we're all empathetic, hopeful, I shouldn't say that, most of us, most of us are empathetic to some degree because we're wired to, you know, really kind of uh, blur the line between self and other to a degree as far as feeling, <coughs> excuse me, as far as, you know, feeling one you know, somebody is, is sad or, you know, upset and also delighting in their joy. You know, we, you know, this is, we smile and we laugh and we giggle and other people are laughing. We start to laugh. We're watching a scary movie even. Um, we, you know, we feel fear, even though it's through a screen, so it's not the same magnitude, but we, and actually Dr. Ramahandran does a lot with this, with mirror neurons. He calls them the Gandhi neurons because they're the neurons uh, in the motor cortex that pick up the feelings of other people. And so that this is neurobiologically supposed to happen. We're wired to care about other people. And obviously, sometimes severe trauma can get in the way of that, ba 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 topic for another time. However, for most of us, we are wild, we are wired to to be aware of, you know, conscious of and able to kind of pick up on the feelings of others. And that is a good thing. I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. That's a good thing. You know that said, um, there 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 are people out here out there for various reasons, um, who who will take as much as you're willing to give, and the people that are kind of often um, have experienced you know severe trauma, and often are deprivation based, and often have you know, uh, some, some like big wounds going on, they, they would be better, you know, better off with, uh, getting professional treatment. Uh, and it's just important to kind of learn, you know, um, as kind of the regular people out there, not who are not clinicians to set boundaries around this because especially severe injury can continue to seek out, seek out that, uh, you know, that, that person who's going to to listen and take on this heaviness endlessly. And it's very important to be aware of sort of the balance or the fine line between going the extra mile for somebody, which is important to do, and and getting swallowed up whole where you're unable to separate from that person's intensity because then that drags you down too and then you're not a you're not a you know good to yourself your partner, your kids, if you have any. And it's just very, very important to differentiate that from that. And also to give your, yourself permission to do so. And the, you know, the higher you rank on the empath scale, the more inclined you're going to be, you know, to give your bone marrow. And what happens when we do that for a long time is our own emotional burnout. And then that, you know, that's affecting our own health. And then again, partners, kids, it, it, it's just, it, it doesn't go anywhere good. It, it isn't, it isn't healthy. So in uh, Breathe Magazine, it says a close friend crumples into your arms, heavy with grief, and you feel the, feel the tears roll down your own cheeks. Your heart is in your mouth and you watch a loved one performing on stage for the first time. You witness an angry exchange at the roadside and become worried. The capacity to connect with the emotions of other people is a fundamental human trait but it's important to recognize when and how to protect against it. So this is what we're saying is it's like most things in life, right? It's not like super cut and dry. Oh, and there goes Giovanni because they're doing stuff in the front yard. 
And, you know, sort of some, some classic examples of, of definitely some things to put boundaries up for would be some of the personality disorders like uh, narcissism borderline personality disorders and you know many most of, most often uh people with with these and obviously antisocial and histrionic there are other ones but i'm thinking of of narcissism and, and borderline there's overlap with narcissism into borderline but typically um these the high majority of people who have these have experienced severe trauma though um because as you know there's also been some you know some very distinct changes that happen the the folks who have who have this are typically highly manipulative um enormously attention getting and they're very um attracted to it's very complicated clinically speaking actually it's very complicated but they're very attracted to empaths and so th- that would be one situation of of sort of some immediate boundary setting because um, even a well-trained clinician, those two things are would be are super challenging to manage. And for the narcissist crew, they don't even tend to walk in the door of 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 a therapist's office because they don't think anything's wrong. It's definitely more of an episode to that one. And out of the personality disorders, a borderline crew are probably or is more than likely to get help if they get noticed because if they get noticed by you know, a parent or, or, or something with their, you know, super reckless behavior. Often there's cutting involved, something called splitting, which means the minute they get ticked, they kind of run the other direction, and kind of cut you loose. It's, it's kind of like a bigger discussion in that way. But just so you get the gist, they can often with um, cur- you know, the courage and commitment can often do well, very well with, with therapists, though for the regular caring individual without the clinical background, they can really wreak havoc in a relationship in a in a household because it's it's there's it's like trying to water flowers with a can that's got a hole in the bottom or something. There you cannot possibly meet their needs or fill them up where they're going to feel better for very long. It's just how it is. And so, um, again, I'm not saying don't be empathetic. Be empathetic. It's just that there's certain situations where boundaries just need to be established and then uh uh, breathe magazine says in his book the age of empathy dutch primatologist franz de waal explains that empathy is a natural behavior observed in all animals our brains have been designed to blur the line between self and other it's an ancient neural circuitry that marks Every mammal from mouse to elephant. And so remember, we're talking about uh, Dr. Ramahandran does a lot of a lot of work with the mirror neurons. We're wired to care about other people. This is a good thing. So there's, again, there's the, the gray area because things in life aren't usually, you know, polarized. It's just, it's just that, and it doesn't mean go the extra mile, go the extra mile. And we need to realize when um, somebody's attachment to us, somebody's needs are bigger than what we can do and we have to set a boundary up there remember what i was saying earlier in a different episode about Brene brown when she did her research on compassionate people and she found that the most compassionate people actually were great boundary setters why because they valued themselves they they weren't willing to be a doormat and and run themselves completely out of juice so they'd be of no use to themselves or anybody else this is a good thing. It's there's like good selfish and bad selfish. This is good selfish. Good selfish that nope, I'm putting up a brick wall because walls are meant to, to keep some things out and keep keep other things in, right? And so we're keeping out, you know, that potential for being completely drained down to our bone marrow. What we're keeping in is our own our own self value and feeling of original worthiness. And there are situations when we have to put those walls up, and it's healthy and it's a good thing. Um, and so another little segment here from, I'm not reading all thing, to, but just little parts from Breathe Magazine. Um, everyone you meet carries a different energy or mood with them. Their posture, facial expression, voice, actions, and the words are all fueled with force, with the force of their current feelings. And when you engage with them, you're exposed to that energy, just as you are to the rays of the sun. That's all well and good when your partner's good mood lifts you out of the doldrums or when 
picking up on the on an air of tension alerts you to a potential threat, but hauling around for too long your best friend's broken heart, your boss's stress, and agitation of the random driver who challenged you at the traffic lights can be wearing. This also brings up something we, we've talked about before, which is mindful giving versus mindless giving. Mindful giving, when we give to our, you know, our best friend or you know, partner, kids, maybe that's the same person with the partner, best friend, partner, um, kids, or you know, your favorite cousin or, or whatever, or it's a stranger that you're feeling very moved to help. You know, it's, it's it, when we feel, you know, authentically charged versus a codependent dope fix, like it's just like, ooh, felt good because I was a human doing for and ran myself into the ground. That is not the same as mindful giving. Mindful giving is the authentic self stepping up to the plate for someone or a circumstance that it's, that it's super, it's, it's authentically pulling to them versus mindless giving which is box checking for all the things we're doing. And the codependent doesn't usually realize this until they become aware of it. Um, or, but you know the difference because you feel more drained and it's because you're getting your self-esteem from doing, from checking all these boxes and doing all these things for these people and staying up and listening or, you know, for five hours straight. There, you can do that mindfully if, that, if that's authentic. And you can do that mindlessly because you don't have any boundaries because you're not valuing your own self and your own time and your own value. And they're very, very different. And you know if you're mindfully giving or giving in a mindless way because one is life giving and one is life taking. And then Breathe Magazine says, add to that the constant pinging of global news on social media platforms. And there's the real possibility of being constantly bombarded with a cocktail of emotions from every corner of the world. I'm telling you right now, you want to go on a news fast. And I'm not saying don't, I mean, especially as an educated person myself, it, I feel responsibility to know what's going on in the world. Um, absolutely. And yet, I, you know, I, I don't reside there, especially at night, because I don't want any of that in my unconscious mind before I go to sleep. And so it's important to kind of zip in like a hummingbird, know what's going on, and then zip right back out. Because listening to over and over how many cases of Corona and over and over, over and over and over again, the whole thing. So have an idea, be careful, be safe. As far as everything else going on in the world, have a very good idea, because we need to care about everything going on in the world, obviously. Though, boundaries, again, news boundaries, because if we reside there, once again, we are, we are still depleted. Depleted people are very limited as to how they can, to themselves and how they can contribute to the rest of the world. So if we really want to, you know, really want to make a difference, lift up the positivity level of the world, lift up, you know, and, and re reduce suffering and make all these changes, we've got to take care of of our own mental health. I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, obvious, right? It's the oxygen mask on first thing. It's very cliche, but it's also very, very true. There's good selfish and bad selfish. Boundaries are good. And I think um, there's another good point made by this article in Breathe magazine, which is called Uninvited Guests, that if we go way back to our ancestors, you know, go way back, you know, Neanderthal, and, and I'm not an expert on all that, all of the names of all the different, I know there's Robustus and Australopithecus, I think. I'm not looking at anything right now. Anyway, ancestors who weren't walking entirely upright, let's just say that, and, and eventually lighting fires, living in caves, you know, hunting, gathering, and doing all that stuff. We weren't wired originally to bump into lots and lots of strangers. I don't mean just like one or two, but think of the six billion people in the world. That's a lot of people we don't know. And so um, here in, in, in the article it says our societies probably our societies probably work best if they mimic as closely as possible the small scale communities of of as close as closely as possible the small scale communities. Oh my gosh, start over. Our society societies probably work best if they mimic as closely as possible the small scale communities of our ancestors. Writes Franz in another title, Our Inner Ape. Uh, he, we certainly did not evolve to live in cities with millions of people where we bump into strangers everywhere we go, are threatened by them in dark streets, sit next to them on the bus, and give them a finger in traffic jams. But if living in an intimate society without Wi-Fi isn't an option, 
How do you find emotional equilibrium? Well, isn't that a good question, Franz? You know, and if we take, you know, the recent pandemic into consideration too, I, I bet we could have an even larger conversation about this. How do we find emotional, emotional equilibrium when we are bombarded, um, which he says, says with like, you know, the energy and, and feelings of so many people around us? And so we've talked about, you know, boundaries, which are super healthy. You know, let anybody tell you otherwise. Because here's the thing. The, the people, when we, when we set boundaries, right, Gen- in general, the only people who get upset about that are the people who benefited from you not having any. Think about that, right? Which just sort of validates you establishing the boundaries um, to keep, you know, to keep keep them up and away from emotional vampires, and, and just being, you know, having your own emotional energy drained and depleted down to nothing, till you have an empty tank. I mean, you all know what it's like. You drive around for too long, the tank runs empty, we run out of gas and we're stranded. It isn't different with emotions. There's only so much emotional energy in one day that we have to give and it runs out. And so here's some, some tips from, from this article. Check in regularly with your emotions because they are good. They're like, a, like an emotional, they're like, emotions are kind of like a compass. Like a navigational tool, they let you know. They let us know, you know, when good stuff is happening, when bad stuff is happening, when we need to get out of danger, when we also need changes to happen, when a relationship isn't going well, whatever. Listen to that inner voice, and if something is, you know, if you're, if you're feeling like you have the, you know, like you've been bitten in the neck and had all your your blood sucked out of you, chances are that's what's happened, and you know, emotional vampire got a hold of you, and you need to set up a boundary. Um, learning how to label feelings is super important because you know there's a small line between frustration and anger. There are you know there's there are different things. We might we might say oh you know really feel like we're feeling like like we're hurt when what we really are is pissed off because really they're almost the same emotion just flipped inside and out. Or we're saying we're angry but really what we are is hurt. Um, that sort of things. <laughs> And then be aware of those again, the emotional vampires that also just want to unload and just take from you. They just want to take from you. And you'll, again, you'll know the difference between like that mutual that mutual friendship with a partner and or best friend. You know where where that exchange goes both ways and it's reciprocated. Even if it's not reciprocated in that exact conversation, long term, you know it's a give and take situation that you both share versus that person who's deprivation based and just. You know, giving you a good old bite in the neck. Okay, you got. You should know the people just want to. It's good to know the people just want to take from you, um, and put a big old boundary up there. Think about you know total dismissal. Quite honestly, um, remember that you can. That you are the. You are the writer of your own script. You can chart your own path. You have autonomy. We can forget that sometimes, especially when we're not aware of our aware and, and knowledgeable. Of our own inner value, that does come right down to that. If we're going to win from within, we have to know our own value. And doormats are basically doormats are doormat are doormats because they don't feel valuable themselves. I mean, that's the whole point. They get their value externally because they don't have it internally. So, and it also doesn't last long. It's that watering can with the whole thing again. So those those who don't know their value seek it outside themselves, and that's a quick fix. Because when it's when it's coming from outside, it's temporary. Only when it's an you know authentic value, knowing that authentic value, does a watering can really fill you up and stay. I mean, this is how it is. Uh, take good care of your space, like protecting your space, like a castle. You know, when a when a good friend of mine and I were over in Ireland, we, we got into this talk about the castles. We're like, castles are not for the for the meek at heart. My gosh, you know, it, you know Fisher Price capitalized on them with the little people and. You know, toddlers play. Cat- castles are not anything about Fisher Price. Let me just tell you, or princesses, because they're meant to keep some people out and let to keep some people in, and they're trap doors or people who are left to just die, and all kinds of very sharp, heavy, large, medieval objects to speed that process up and stuff. And there's a reason. Yeah, you know, they were taking care of their space for sure. So take good care of your space. And then here's another one: is just limit your exposure. Because you can't be in the tangled mess with an emotional vampire if you don't kind of walk in the door. So, 
if you're still kind of, you know, if you're in that codependent mode still and you're becoming aware, which is fantastic news, be aware that if you don't walk in, if you don't walk into the mess in the first place, you can't be depleted of your energy, right? So it might be, even though it's hard boundary to set, if you can start out by, you know, something easier, like an email or a text or ignoring a text or whatever that means for you, just don't walk in in the first place. Okay. Beware of emotional vampires. This is Kimberly Quinn signing off from Northern Vermont. Have a mindful day. Thank you.